They're trying. Is it on German? Is it on? Am I on German? Hello? Huh? Hello? Try now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you get the mental powers. That's <laughs> Yeah. This is on. <laughs> is this is this not on the right channel or something? Maybe. Uh, there's not a way to tell, is there? Do I? It looks like it's getting signal, right? Does that mean it's getting signal? Yeah. Are the speakers on? Uh, oh, it's correct. It is. Oh, is that right? Hello? Ready? Now, now we got them on. Thanks, Zavros. <laughs> Thanks for your help getting it all sorted out, man. I try my best. All right, good morning. So anybody remember what, uh, where we were last week in uh, biblical? It's been a while since you've heard me. I've been in teaching the kids for a while, so uh, you've had a nice break from me. Um, anybody remember what, what part of the Bible we were in last week? Genesis. Last week, yeah, Genesis. <laughs> Not quite. Malachi. So, so what, where is, uh, if you turn your Bible to Malachi, where is Malachi in the Old Testament? The last book. So today we're going to go to the New Testament, right? Not quite. See this page right here? <laughs> this is what we're going to be learning about today. So it's called the intertestament, intertestamental period. And ha how many has ever been in a Sunday school class where you talked about what happened between the Old Testament book of Malachi and the New Testament? Anybody ever? Ms. Gale has. Anybody else? Anybody ever studied that period? Yeah. Pastor Jason? Yeah? Yes? So good, we have a couple experts so they can jump in and correct me when I get things wrong. Because this is not something that I've studied a lot either, so this was a good time for me to, in preparation, understanding this period of time. And um, there's really a lot of things going on that are, are very helpful for our understanding of, um, of the New Testament. When Jesus comes onto the scene, you, know, you can sense, if you just read from Malachi to, to the New Testament, you, can get, you get the sense a lot has changed. Right? Things are not nearly the same as they were but we don't really have a lot of uh, indication about what those things were. So this is good context and history for us. Uh, um, so obviously there's really not a lot of scripture that specifically deals with this period. But as you, as you can see, there is some prophecy and there's things that we can pick up from the New Testament as well. And, then, and it really provides a lot of good context. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from this. So let's start uh, by opening a word of prayer and then we'll jump in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here again this morning. Thank you that we can learn from your word, we can learn about uh, your church, we can learn about your people. As we've studied the whole Old Testament, Lord, in this Sunday school class, we thank you for all that you've taught us through the Old Testament, that uh, you have protected your people, you have been with your people, and you are preparing your people for the Redeemer, who is Jesus. And we pray this morning as we study about the history between the Testaments, that you would give us wisdom, and that we would learn from that, those history, from the history and from the context of uh, you know, how we can understand the New Testament even more clearly and better. We pray that you would teach us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll start off with our verse, memory verse. Uh, so we'll read this. Let's read this all together. Jeremiah 33, 7 through 8. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all their guilt of their sin against me. And I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. All right. Beautiful. So this is, um, 
Jeremiah is prophesying, and this is uh, what what is this prophesying about? Has this been accomplished so far in the history? We got to Malachi. So what's happened uh, by the time we get to Malachi in the Old Testament? Of course, Jeremiah is writing uh, you know, before and during the Babylonian exile, right? So people are carried off, and the, and God is punishing His people. So He's giving them a prophecy of a new covenant, right? And so uh, at this point. What's happened to the people of Israel? They were in exile for how long? 70 years. And then what happened to them? They came back, at least some of them, right? Came back uh, to Jerusalem. And what did they do in Jerusalem? Yep. And the temple. So they rebuilt the temple, and then they rebuilt the city walls, right? And, um, and then Malachi, what we learned about last week, you know, a little bit, long, little bit later after the, after the walls had been built, Malachi comes to prophesy, and he, he prophesies two things. He brings charges against the people. And what does he say? He says, even though, are they, uh, even though they're back in the temple, they're back in the land, they're worshiping God, um, what is their worship like? Is it, is it faithful and honoring to God? It's corrupt. And how is it corrupt this time? So in the past, the reason they were put out of the land was because of what? Mostly. Idol. Idol, idol worship, right? They were integrating idols into their worship, and they kept going after other gods. So now that they're back in the temple, are they worshiping idols now? No. But their worship is still not pure, right? So what's wrong with their worship at this point? Well, they're not obeying or giving tithes. Okay, so they're not fully obeying and giving the best, right? They're, they're not giving tithes. What else? Yeah, so they're giving, instead of giving the best and the un, unstained and unblemished sacrifices, they're giving the lame the blind, right? Things that they don't really want anyway, they go ahead and give it to God, right? So their worship is external only. It's not coming from the heart, and it's really not the best, right? So, so it's still unpure worship. So Malachi comes, and, he, um, and, he's, and he's prophesying. Right, right. He says, one coming to make to make the way, right? So it's John the Baptist and the, and the Messiah, right? So that's where Malachi was. That's where we are in the history of our um, uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Has this verse been fulfilled yet? No, it's been fulfilled. I will. Right. Well, this was this was happening in Jeremiah, which is before Malachi. Sorry, I'm kind of getting. So, but has a lot of people thought once they left once they left Babylon and came back to Israel, what did they expect to happen once they came back to Jerusalem, especially when they rebuilt the temple? What did they expect? They expected all of this to happen, right? They expected, and if you think about, there's many other prophecies in Jeremiah, there's many other prophecies in Isaiah um, and Ezekiel, right? And it's talking about the beautiful riches of the new covenant. I'm going to make you even better than you were before. More riches. The, the, the temple is going to be uh, beautiful, amazing, right? All these things. They come back to the temple. And do you know, do you remember what happens when they rebuild the temple? The, the old people that had seen the, the first temple, do you know what they did when they saw the rebuilt temple? They cried. They cried, right? Why did they cry? You know, for joy or? No, not for joy. Why did they cry? Do you remember? They remembered the old, the old temple, and it was so much better, right? So now here they are. They're expecting for God to immediately fulfill all these promises, and they're kind of disappointed, right? They're saying God hasn't really fulfilled these promises the way we expected, right? So here we are in Malachi, and though there has been some partial fulfillment, people have come back into the land. They have uh, uh, rebuilt the temple. This, this verse and all these verses talking about the new covenant is still yet to come, right? And so we end Malachi, and we've got uh, how many years b between Malachi and the New Testament? About 400 years. So 400 years of times where they're still waiting. They're still waiting for God to fulfill all these prophecies, right? And um, let's see here. They're still waiting for all these things to be fulfilled. And not only that, but is God, to, is God sending prophets to them at this time? You read, we read through the beginning of the Old Testament, and there's, old, there's prophets, there's priests, there's all these ways that God is talking to his people, communicating with his people. Now, all of a sudden, after Malachi, no prophets for 400 years. 
So just think about that for a minute. Put yourself in, that, in, those, in those shoes. You've got these wonderful promises from God. You've seen somewhat a glimmer of, of, of um, fulfillment. But so, so much of this seems so far away and so far out. right? And God is not apparently speaking to them anymore. So this is, uh, so we're at the end of the Old Testament. Um, are we at the end of the Old Covenant yet? No. Not yet, right? The New Covenant has not been uh, initiated or inaugurated yet. So this is during that 400-year period where God has still not brought these um, covenant promises to fruition. And we talked about this. So what are, the, what are these promises that you can just think of? What things still need to be fulfilled that God has promised them? The Messiah, that's the big one, right? The Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, number one. What else? The, the restoration of Israel and Judah are still under Persian rule at the end of the book of Malachi. Right. So they're still under, they're still under uh, outside rule, right? Uh, first it was Persia. We'll get into some of the other things that happened throughout the, the 400 years. But they are not really their own nation. And, and you, you mentioned two things. You said Judah and Israel, right? Some of the prophets, uh, including what we just read, talk about the reunification of Israel and Judah, right? Has that happened? No. In fact, actually, it's pretty impossible to see how that could happen. Uh, why, why, is it, why would it be so impossible at that time? Judah, we have Judah as a remnant, but what's happened to the northern tribes of Israel? They're scattered. They're dispersed, right? Uh, so really, there's no like there's no central group where here's the northern tribes of Israel, right? So it seems pretty uh, difficult to understand how that would happen. All right, but a whole lot has happened. So if we read Galatians four, four and five, he's talking about uh, Christ coming into the world, right? And he says, "But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to those." Uh, to redeem those who were under the law so we might receive adoptions as sons. Amazing passage. Well, I wanted to focus on it. It says, for, but the fullness of time have come. So, so first, I mean, this is, a, this is an easy science school answer. You guys all know the answer to this question. But was God, was God delaying? Was God not fulfilling his promises these 400 years? Was it, was it a part of God's plan? Yes. It was a part of God's plan. Right? Even though we don't have a lot about it, lots of things were happening. That was part of God's plan. And God sent his son just at the right time. When everything was ready for his son, he sent his son. And obviously that time was not when Malachi came. It was not anywhere in that 400 years. But those 400 years were preparing for Jesus to come. So that's what we're going to kind of <coughs> learn about a little bit. All right, so here, uh, a little bit of a timeline. So we, we go back in time, uh, 607 B.C., so 607 years before Christ. That's when the Babylonian captivity begins. So Babylon comes, and they see Jerusalem. And at this time, they don't destroy it yet, but they do take captives, right? And one, what, uh, what, what are one of the captives that they take, um, or, or who are some of the first captives that they take to Babylon? Famous in the Bible. Daniel, yep, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, right? Those are some of the first people that were carried off. So they, they came in, and they took the young men, and they carried a lot of the young men off into Babylon, and they put them in service of the Babylonian Empire, right? So that begins in 607. About 20 years later, um, Babylon actually completely destroyed Jerusalem, right? So here they come in. This is where we, we get a lot of Jeremiah's prophecies and Lamentations is written around this time. Now Babylonia comes in, they totally destroy it. So they destroy the Jerusalem, and then what's in Jerusalem that they destroy? Temple. The temple. And why is that so significant, especially to the Jewish people? That their, that their temple is destroyed. That's where God was, right? So it's not just a place that they came to gather and worship, right? If we were, if we were here today, we were, uh, say we have our own church building, if something happened to that building, it got destroyed, we'd be upset, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't be happy about it, but we would just be somewhere else, right? Um, but, but this is not exactly the, the, the function of the temple. The, they do come to the temple to worship. But it really is, as Bert said, it is God's dwelling place. God filled the temple. If you remember the story when Solomon was dedicating the temple, they dedicate it and a cloud comes in, fills the temple. Right? That's God's presence, filling the temple. And that's how God was dwelling with his people, was in the temple. And God dwelling with his people... Um, is really the central promise of the whole Bible, right? That's, we talk about covenant theology and the covenants 
um, of, of um, all, all the covenants that God makes with Israel and, and with us and even the new covenant, the central promise that's, that's, that's in, in them is that God is with us, right? Emmanuel, God with us. That's why that, that phrase for Jesus is so important because that is the promise of the covenants, is that God will dwell with his people. So here we are, um, the temple's in Jerusalem. In fact, there were some people that actually were so comfortable with the temple uh, if you remember in Jeremiah, they were saying, there's no way that the temple's ever going to be destroyed because that's where God lives, right? So we have the temple, so we're safe, right? And God said, no, the temple's going to be destroyed. And that was a symbol of God departing from them. He was no longer dwelling with them. So that's why that was such a monumental um, uh, event and not just, not just a building being destroyed. So they are carried off into captivity uh, totally then um, by the Babylonian ca captivity. But then what happens to Babylon? Yeah, somebody else comes, right? Somebody takes over Babylon. So it kind of reminds me of, uh, it talks about uh, in Psalm 2, the nation's rage, right? So who's controlling all these different nations? God, right? So we have an empire that looks undefeatable. Babylonian empire was undefeatable oh, until Persia comes and, and defeats them, right? So now Persia um, conquers Babylon, but the people are still in captivity now under Persia, right? So then... Um, Cyrus is, uh, is the king of Persia. He's the one that captures Babylon. So just, so, just a year or so later after he, after he uh, captures Babylon, what does he do to the Jews? He sends them back. He says, you can go back, you can rebuild the temple, right? And, and not only does he send them back, but he gives them supplies, he gives them money, he protects them, right? And so he sends back um, uh, Zerubbabel, who leads the first, uh, the first group of people back to to uh, Jerusalem, and they start to rebuild the temple. Um, we kind of gone through this history. There was a delay, it got partially rebuilt, then there was some opposition, it finally gets rebuilt again. Um, and then we have several years after that, after the temple is completed, there's still the wall that is broken down, which means that everybody is exposed, there's no protection, right? So Nehemiah comes and build, uh, helps to build, rebuild the wall. So the, the wall is rebuilt, in uh, 454 BC, and then you know about 40 years later, you have Malachi coming to prophesy, which is what we talked about. So that's kind of where we are, 400 BC. So the first empire that, that we're talking about with uh, with this period is the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And that was King Cyrus who took over the Babylonian Empire and sends people home. Um, <laughs> If you guys are real careful as we're going through Isaiah and as we go through some of these other readings, you can see that uh, this was prophesied in, uh, by Isaiah, it's prophesied by Jeremiah, and it's also prophesied by Daniel, along with a lot of other stuff that happens in this period of time. Right? But uh, King Cyrus and the Persian Empire is proph prophesied multiple times well before uh, any of this is happening. Uh, Isaiah is written pretty significantly, I don't know how many years, but hundreds hundreds of years before uh, this actually happens. <laughs> Jeremiah's you know, a couple hundred years too. So all this, all this stuff is uh, prophesied in the, in the Old Testament and uh, by the prophets and it's coming to fruition. The Medo-Persian Empire lasts uh, for a while uh, till 331 BC. And who takes over after that? Anybody know? Alexander the Great. Yeah, so you've got, oh this is, too bad. So the Greek Empire, uh, first, it starts with Philip of Macedon, who, what does he do? What's significant of, uh, about, about Philip of Macedon? He's the father of Alexander the Great. He's the father of Alexander the Great, and he's the one who unites uh, the, the different factions of the Greek um, co uh, countries and, and states, right? So he, he unites everybody together, and then he is Alexander the Great's um, father. Philip is actually assassinated by one of his bodyguards. Nice bodyguard, I guess, to have, right? Um, and then, um, so when he's assassinated, then Alexander becomes king at age 20. Um, and then the first thing Alexander has to do is there's, a, there's a, all of a sudden all these uh, revolts and uprising within the Greek country, right? So this has just been unified, not exactly the most stable thing. So the first thing he does is deals with some of these revolts. And then uh, just a few years later, then he starts uh, his campaign against Persia. And what does Alexander the Great do? Conquers basically the entire world at the time, right? And, and does it take him a long time to do this? 
by about 10 years, a little over 10 years, conquered the entire known world, right? hence the name Greek. Uh, so in three, uh, 331 is when Alexander takes over um, and defeats Babylon and takes over, um, uh, now, now he is in control of Jerusalem. Right? So this is when the Babylonian Empire, um, I'm sorry, the uh, Persian Empire ends. Uh, Babylon was still an important city during that whole period. So it's the Persian Empire, and Alexander now defeats the Persian Empire in 331 and takes over control of the Jewish nation. So Alexander the Great. Uh, so you remember the famous uh, philosophers of, um, uh, of this, this classical Greek time. First, first one was who? Socrates. And then his student was Plato. And then his student was Aristotle. Right? So that, that was kind of the different schools of thought in Greek, Greek philosophy. And then his, Aristotle's most famous student was actually Alexander the Great. So we don't really think about Alexander being a philosopher, right? Or, or being trained in that. But he was, he was trained by Aristotle himself, right? And the, the interesting thing about Aristotle's philosophy was that he was very, very concerned about a unifying philosophy, right? He saw things as one. So how do we put together all these different strains of thought? How do we unify science and philosophy and religion? And he was very interested in seeing how all of these things fit together as one system. And that's important because um, that vision then was passed along to Alexander. And so when he then started conquering the world, he brought this philosophy of unification, right? So not only was he conquering uh, peoples and nations, but he was trying to unify them under what culture and what religion? Greek, right? So he was trying not, not only to conquer them, but he was trying to make the whole world Greek, right? And so this is called Hellenization, right? This, we get this idea of Hellenization. Uh, it really starts with um, Alexander. It, it comes in later in some stronger forms, but he's the one who, arch, uh, he's the architect of this whole project and, um, and he's doing this. So it's said that when he, um, when he traveled to, to in his campaigns to conquer the world, not only did he travel with uh, armies, obviously, but it's said that he had the biggest sort of army of scientists that the world has ever known as well. And um, it's kind of said that, that there hasn't been that much money spent on scientific advancement until the space race of more modern days. So he spent all kinds of resources on scientific development and discovery. And as he was conquering, they were, they were, the scientists were gathering samples, they were sending them back to, to, to Greece to be studied and to learn and to learn how all of this fit together. So he obviously conquered the Jewish uh, nation and he still wanted them to be Greeks, especially cult culturally, but he did allow them religious freedom, right? So there was, there was, there was really a lot of good freedom under Alexander for the Jewish people, but then he dies very shortly in 323 at the age of 33. Pretty amazing, conquers the world by the age of 33. So um, if you haven't conquered the world yet, I don't know what you're doing, and then what? And he died. Oh, how did he die? They don't know exactly. Um, they, some people think he was poisoned uh, when, he, when, he, uh, when he died, he was sort of in a uh, stupor, and some people think that he was actually assassinated and poisoned, but nobody knows for sure how he died. That seems, that seems right, <laughs> uh, but nobody really knows. Um, and then after he died, anybody know who takes over? So it gets split between his four, four generals. So right. you have Ptolemies, Seleucus, um, Antigone maybe, and then there's the guy who basically runs Macedon in Greece. So it kind of gets the splits four ways. Yep, exactly. So. Um, so, so it doesn't go to uh, Alexander's son or anybody else, but there's actually even more generals than this at first, but these are the four main ones that, that then split up the empire into these four, these four nations. That's gonna go real well, right? Anytime you split up, a, uh, split up an empire into all these things, that goes well. Um, so what happens here is kind of a map of how they ended up being, um, being uh, uh, proportioned out. And after the four, uh, are split up, there really becomes two that become very, very prominent. And that is Ptolemies, uh, which, which takes Egypt uh, in, the, in the south, and then the Seleucid Empire, which takes Syria and up in the north, right? And then guess what's, what's here in between? Israel. Jerusalem and Israel, right? Palestine. So I, I think Jason, when he, was, um, when he came back from his last trip to Israel, talked about how, how much um, 
you know, conflict there's been in this area, and you can see why, right? You've got these major empires, and this is sort of the one path that connects them. So uh, when uh, Seleucid and uh, Ptolemies, they both, they both claim this area as theirs. They both say, this is mine. And um, Ptolemies actually is the one who first secures it, so it becomes part of the, uh, of the southern part of the empire um, under the uh, Ptolemies' reign and empire, and then um, uh, Seleucid stays to the north, at least for a while. And that's where in Daniel 11, the king of the north and the king of the south, that whole chapter is very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, that's who he's talking about. The yep. king of the north and the king of the south are the Right. There's, if you read Daniel, almost, almost all the prophecy in Daniel is, is related to these, this period of time, especially this Greek uh, period of time uh, that we're, that we're um, learning about. So Ptolemy um, kind of follows in the footsteps of Alexander, and he allows for religious freedom for the, for the Jews. Um, but the Jews uh, st are still in this process of Hellenization. So rel religiously, they're allowed to kind of form their own communities, there's sort of a community within a community, but there is also a lot of pressure just culturally to become like Greeks. Right? So during this period of time, uh, so Alexandria is in Egypt. That was founded by Alexander himself, but that city is now growing. It's becoming more and more prominent in the world, um, in literature, and, um, um, in, its, in its scientific discovery, and, um, and trade, and all these things. It's becoming extremely important. And a lot of Jews actually uh, go to Alexandria. At this, at this period of time too. So they're, they're, they're there and they're helping to advance this city and be a part of, um, of all, this, all this stuff that's going on there. And um, including, this is when there starts to become a translation of the Bible. So Jews of course uh, spoke Hebrew. This was the language of the people. This was the language of their texts, right? The religious texts. Now the, uh, the Greeks come in and culturally, what now are people starting to speak? Greek including the Jews, right? So the Jews are now starting to, to speak Greek. Um, a lot of them are, are trying to preserve uh, things, so they're teaching Hebrew to their children, but basically, you know, they're speaking Greek in the whole world around. In order to function in society, they have to be speaking Greek. So what do you think happens to uh, the, lang the Hebrew language after a while? They try to keep it up as long as possible, what do you think happens? They start to lose it, right? So now, now people are not understanding Hebrew as much as they, should, as they did in the past, and so, um, but the Jews are still religiously very Jewish. So they, they decide to translate the, the, the Hebrew scriptures into, into Greek. And what do we call, the, what's the name of that translation? Bless you. <laughs> the Septuagint, right. So, um, so that becomes then the, the, uh, the, the uh, version of the scriptures that everybody's reading, including in the New Testament, who's reading, who's reading the Septuagint in the, when we get to the New Testament? Everybody, right? Uh, all Jews, including Jesus and the and the apostles, right? So sometimes when you're reading when you're reading in the New Testament and you read a quote from the Old Testament and you go back and you look at the Old Testament, what do you find every once in a while? A little bit of differences, right? There's certain things that are slightly different. The reason for that is not that they misquoted; it's that that when they're when they're quoting the Old Testament, they're quoting from the Greek language, and then we're translating directly from the Hebrew. So sometimes there's a little bit of differences that show up because of that translation. Right? So the Septuagint is being written during this. It takes a couple hundred years to finish the whole uh, translation of the Septuagint, and this is happening during this time. Then we get uh, a little over 100 years later, um, Antiochus III captures Judea. So he is from the Seleucid Empire, and he, he, doesn't, he didn't give up like Seleucid did. He wants to come down and finish the job and take over the Palestine area and take over the Jews, which he does. And now he intensifies this whole Hellenization uh, process. So now it's not, just, it's not just culturally, he is trying to impose this much harder, much faster, and including in the religious context as well. Um, and so during this time, you start to get some people who resist that. So at the beginning, there's not a lot of resistance because there's a lot of freedom, right? So people can, can do what they want. They can still practice their religion. Nobody forced them to give up Hebrew. It just happened more naturally. Now they're being forced. And anytime you force somebody, guess what you get? You get resistance. People say, no, you're not going to force me to do that. So uh, you get the, the Hasidians 
which what does that sound like today? We, we hear of what kind of Jews? Hasidic uh, Jews. So this is where they have their, their origin. So they're uh, uh, Hasidians called the pious ones. And so they are really concerned about resisting this cultural influence of Hellenization and resisting that, uh, all these things. And out of the Hasidians later on actually come the Pharisees. Right? So the Pharisees become, um, are, are another, uh, another sort of offshoot of the Hasidians. And they, the Pharisees being separated ones. So they, were, again, were trying to be faithful to the scriptures. They were trying to be faithful to their culture and to their religious identity. Right? So the Pharisees, when we, find, when we read about them in the New Testament, we have a good impression of them or a bad impression? Bad impression. They're not exactly the heroes of the story, right? Uh, they're, in fact, they're, they're sort of the enemies. They're resisting Jesus at every turn, and, um, um, and they're very externalized and legalistic, right? Well, at this point, though, when they first pop up, they are faithful. They are, the, they are, they are looking for reform. They're trying to resist uh, sort of the pagan influence and the cultural influence of the Greek, and they are trying to be true to the scriptures. Uh, so they have a very pure motive, and they do this well at, at the beginning. Right? But obviously, we know how that turns out. <coughs> um, so after uh, so after Antiquitus the, the third, we get Antiquitus the fourth. You know, very very clever naming system, right? Um, and he's called he calls himself Antiquities Epiphanes, which we hear. What does that word Epiphany mean? We hear we talk about it at Christmas time, right? It means manifestation, and so he is actually calling himself. Um, uh, God made manifest, right? And so what does that remind us of? It's only one that's actually been, right? Jesus, Jesus is God made manifest, God in the flesh. He's essentially saying, I am God in the flesh. He's taking on what Jesus would, would become uh, later on, and he's saying that this is me. And um, was that? I'm just saying that's why he has to get rid of the Jews. Exactly, so this is, this is no longer a pluralistic society where everybody can just kind of do what they want religiously, right? Now all of a sudden, now he has to impose this on everybody, and anybody who worships differently is now an enemy, right? And so um, he actually imposes not only, not only uh, policies of Hellenization, but anti-Jewish policies. He persecutes the Jews, slaughters thousands of Jews, um, and then he, he makes Sabbath observance, circumcision, and possession of Jewish scriptures Capital offenses, right? So if you're going to pick three things in the Old Testament that <laughs> to really make the Jews mad, <laughs> this is probably the three of them, right? Um, this it basically they can't practice their religion without these things. So uh, there's a story that that um, there were there were two women that circumcised their sons on the eighth day, sort of in secret. It was found out about, um, and uh, he comes in, kills kills the kills the babies, hangs the babies around the mother's necks, makes them walk around the wall. And then they pushed them off the wall. So this he wasn't he wasn't playing around. Ruthless, ruthless guy. This all really culminates um, again at the temple. So we talked about the importance of the temple. Right? Now we have the rebuilt temple. And the temple is just as important now as it was back then. And so now in the temple, uh, um, he dedicates the temple not to the worship of, of Yahweh, but it dedicates the temple worship to Zeus. So he, he, he institutes pagan idolatry into the temple itself, and he comes in and he offers a pig on the altar. Right? And if you know anything about um, the Old Testament laws, what, what, is that, what is that saying? That he offers a pig on the altar. Desecration, right? Uh, it's total desecration of the temple. Um, and so that is kind of what kicks off you know, really, really strong opposition and leads to uh, what we call the Maccabean Revolt. revolt sorry, Revolt. revolt. Um, so uh, Matthias, uh, in 161, rises up in protest and starts sort of guerrilla warfare against this, the Greek Empire and, and, uh, uh, because of all these things that um, has been instituted. He actually dies. Um, I don't know how he dies, <laughs> but he dies uh, in, in pretty, pretty early on. And his son, one of his sons, third oldest son, Judas, uh, takes over a leadership for this revolt. And he's called then Judas the Maccabean, which means Judas the Hammer. How would you like that nickname? Like, uh, so, so he's not, he's not standing down. He leads, he leads the revolt, and it's really, really a miraculous thing. I mean, can you imagine the greatest empire in the world and these, these guys in guerrilla warfare 
are going to defeat this and win their freedom. So, um, so just in a few years, they, um, they win uh, uh, some concessions, which includes religious freedom, which is the most important thing that they were looking for. Right? So now they, um, they have the religious freedom. They open up the temple once again, and they rededicate it. And then that, that rededication is, becomes a feast in Jewish, and, uh, in Jewish um, tradition called the Visa, Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah. So this is what Hanukkah is celebrating. When Jews celebrate Hanukkah today, this is what they're celebrating. They're celebrating the, the victory of the Maccabean revolt and rededication of the temple. Um, and then the story goes that when they went in, they went into, you know, of course there's lampstands. They had to light the lampstands, and they only had enough oil for one day. So they light the lampstands with the oil, and it lasts eight days, which is where you get the eight days of Hanukkah. Um, and so that is the, the beginning of that. And that tradition goes on. And then a few, uh, you know, after 20, year, 20 or so years of fighting, they finally win free, full freedom from world domination. They are now an independent state. And they last that way, they, they last that way until what empire comes next? Romans. Romans. All right. Who's the general that, that conquers Jerusalem? Ptolemy the Great. Well, and for the Roman Empire, Pompey. Okay. Yeah, Ptolemy would... Um, was uh, Greek. So he comes in in 63 and now takes over and conquers Judea. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, then sort of we're getting closer to where the New Testament starts and the, the occupation of Rome. Um, and Rome, the Roman Empire then institutes Herod the Great. They appoint him as sort of a puppet king over uh, Judea. Um, and he's actually installed by Mark Antony, who we're, we've heard of, right? And Octavius, who becomes. Everybody know who got Octavius, the name changed to Caesar Augustus. Yep. So before he was Caesar, uh, he had influence, and they, uh, the two of them sort of worked to install Herod the Great as, um, as king over Judea. And Herod the Great, uh, you, might hear, you might have heard of uh, Herod's temple. Um, um, and so what Herod did is he actually refurbished the temple, so that second temple that was rebuilt, he, re he refurbishes it, he uh, beautifies it, and he expands it, right? So it's really the second temple still, but he expands that temple, and that is the very temple that Jesus comes to in the New Testament, right? All right, so all this, was, as Jason sort of started to say, though we don't have scriptures from this part of the period, we have actually, the Bible talks about this. And so um, Daniel specifically, and Daniel 2, we're not going to go through all the passages, but Daniel 2 uh, gives this image of a statue. This is... Um, um, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about this statue, head of gold, uh, uh, chest of uh, silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, and then a stone comes and crushes all of them, right? So we have um, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon was the head of gold, then we have the Medo-Persian Empire, then we have Greece, and then we have Rome as the legs of iron, and then they're waiting for this stone to come and crush, crush it all. So, the, you know, the, these people are they're obviously, they're, they're, they're very, very uh, diligent about the scriptures. They know all these prophecies. This is what they're expecting, right? In Daniel 7, you have a prophecy of four beasts, um, and, and the different beasts uh, uh, represent, again, those four empires, kind of a retelling of those four empires. But then this is what I want to focus on, starting 7, verse 12. It says, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was prepared, uh, presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Who is this? What kingdom is this talking about? Christ. Now they didn't. They didn't necessarily know that, right? What were they expecting in a lot of ways? A human kingdom, right? That's why when we read the New Testament, people are like, "When are you going to kick out Rome? When are you going to destroy Rome?" This is what they were expecting, because right? they were expecting. They were taking this not in not. They were taking it actually in a much smaller sense than what it what, than what it really meant, right? This really means that His kingdom is over the whole world and over everyone. So, um, and then this phrase is really important, one like the Son of Man. What's the most common title for Jesus in the New Testament? Son of Man, right? So when he's saying, I'm the Son of Man, 
to us, it sounds like, oh, he's, talking, he's, he's saying he's the son of, son of God. He's saying he's human, right? That's not what he was saying. He was actually explicitly referring to this passage. I am the son of man come on the clouds from the ancient of days, right? So here, way back in Daniel, we have Jesus being, being predicted, and now we start to see this come, and, and we start to see what they're expecting in those 400 years. And then Daniel 8, you have, um, this is a very explicit one, the ram and the goat. And this, this uh, actually in this passage, Gabriel comes and interprets this to, to Daniel. And he explicitly says the ram is the, um, is the Medo-Persian empire and the goat is going to be the Greek empire. It actually split, explicitly says it in those terms right, right there in that interpretation. Um, so that was, that was prophesied again. And then on and on, Daniel 9, Daniel 11. As uh, Jason mentioned, you have these prophecies that's talking very specifically. If you read these prophecies, there's very specific things. Um, if you go back uh, to these four, oops, these four different uh, beasts, um, one of the beasts was a leopard. Guess what empire that was? Greece. Leopards are fast. They're known for their speed. That was predicting Greece is going to come in with, with great speed and take over the world, which is exactly what happened. So... Very, very explicit, very, very detailed things. So much so that, that when, when secular people and, and scholars read some of these things, you know what they say? Oh, this must have been written way later. This must have been written during the time that these things were happening, right? Because they're so specific, but that's not true. It's true, they were prophecy, right? And then, um, and then it also talks about, there's, there's um, talks, talking about the desolation of the temple. It's talk, there's, there's multiple references to the and Jesus says the abomination of desolation. Well, there's references to that in Daniel, which is talking about the slaughtering, uh, the, 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 the uh, defiling of the temple, the idol worship in the temple, and the, and the pigs being sacrificed in the temple. So when Jesus says it, it's a reference backwards to that, to Epiphanes, and then it's a reference forward to the second destruction of the temple uh, in, by the Romans. All right, so in the fullness of time. So what, what we start to see all these preparations for the Son of Man, right? for Jesus coming in the flesh. We see the prophecies that Jesus is going to be the Son of Man coming to establish his kingdom, to crush the, the other empires of the world. right? And, and um, he calls himself the Son of Man. Uh, John, in John 10, this is interesting. This is the, uh, John 10 is the Feast of Dedication. So what is, what, what is that? Hanukkah. So Jesus was actually at the Feast of Dedication, at that celebration of Hanukkah, and he calls himself, it's at that point, where he's actually very explicit in calling himself God himself. And he's saying, you guys are dedicating, you're, you're, you're dedicating the temple, and you're celebrating that, but who's the true temple? I'm the true temple, right? John 8, which is probably pretty closely actually connected to John 10, even though it's separated by a chapter or so, um, he's saying, I am the light of the world. What's the festival of um, Hanukkah also called? Festival of lights, right? And John is say, or, um, uh, Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. You guys are looking at the temple. These things are shadows. They're passing away. I am coming to fulfill, fulfill this. And of course, most of Jesus' teaching is talking about the kingdom of God and the nature of the kingdom. All, almost all the parables are talking about God's kingdom and the initiation and inauguration and the character what, is, what does his kingdom actually look like? And of course he says, it's not a physical kingdom, right? It's a spiritual kingdom. Um, and so he's teaching all of that throughout his time. So all these things are, are setting that up. And then we have the, pro the providence of God. So specifically I want to think about these two things here, Hellenization and Roman dominion. How did those two things actually help in God's providence? The, the pro propagation of the gospel after, you know, after Jesus is crucified, and it rises again, then the gospel spreads everywhere, right? Were you going to say something? No, it's just you have the common language in Hellenization for Greek. Right. So you have people could understand the New Testament when it was written in the Septuagint and the Old Testament. Yep. And then Roman Dominion, you have the Peace of the Romans or Pax Romana, which allows for, for instance, the transit of Paul throughout the Mediterranean world. Yeah, uh, exactly. Peacefully without too much trouble. So, so this is, as far as I know, I'm not, I'm not, a, uh, you know, I could be wrong about this, but as far as I know, this is probably the first time in the world that there is a common language throughout the whole world due to the process of Hellenization. There's a peace, kind of a forced peace, <laughs> right? But there's a peace of, that the Roman Empire brings that allows travel, 
Right? If, if everybody is warring against each other, it's kind of hard to get into those countries and preach the gospel. Right? So there's this Roman peace. And also, what did the Romans build? Roads. Roads. So now all of a sudden, Christ is risen from the dead. The apostles, you know, they're writing the New Testament. And they're going, Paul is going on missionary journeys. Now, what is he able to do? Preach in a common language. Travel peacefully-ish. And travel at all because of roads. Right? So God's providence. In the fullness of time, God was waiting. All these, all these kingdoms that are opposed to God were being used by God to allow for the gospel to go forth. So application, was it really 400 years of silence? We call it that. No. God was not prophesying new things, right? But God had already prophesied about this time. And obviously God was working in this time. What attributes of God do we learn about from this? It's always at work, right? Even when it seems like there's silence. I mean, I'm sure the people there were feeling that. They're 400 years. We haven't heard from God. There's been no prophet. We're reading about this time in the past. When is he going to fulfill his promises, right? People are passing it down to their, to their uh, children. Being scared of these other empires, taking away their culture, taking away their religion. All these things. If we're in their shoes. This sounds crazy, right? But God is at work in that. What else, what else do we learn about? He's faithful. Yeah. He is faithful. We gotta trust him, right? I mean, think and then, so if we put ourselves now in the context. Is it sometimes hard to see God working today in the world? Is it sometimes seem like the world is overtaking us as Christians? It seems like that. But what do we know? He's not he's he's in charge, right? And um, so what dangers, see, we kind of learned about some of the cultural things. What dangers uh, do we learn from this about culture um, and how its culture can affect um, us as Christians? Is there always pressure for us to conform to the world? Yes. Always pressure. Sometimes to integrate, to integrate right? Exactly. Sometimes it's passive and we want to do it because we want to be like everyone else. Sometimes it's forced upon us. Right? And then and then what do we learn about the reaction to culture? How can how can we, you know, first of all, we should remember what Bert said. He's always God's always at work. And God is faithful, right? So during these things, God is faithful. Trust in him. So but what what can we learn about um, sort of our reaction? How can our reactions be sometimes misguided? What are the different traps we can fall into when when we relate to culture? Fear. Fear. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that can lead us to either do two things. It can lead us to compromise. We didn't talk about the Sadducees, but they were kind of compromisers, right? They came in, they're like, yeah, we can, we can kind of play both sides of this. We'll be Greek, and we'll, we'll have influence, and then we'll try to be religious a little bit, but we'll get rid of all the things that, that make that um, you know, not powerful to the culture. That's, that's one thing. So compromise. We could be out of fear. We could compromise our, our beliefs, right? And then what did the Pharisees do? They went the other way. Legalism, right? So they, again, they started out good. They were pure. They were kind of the reformers of the day. They were the Puritans of the day. But then they also gave in fear and became a war with, with the culture, right? And became, um, and became legalistic in their observance. So they missed Christ. They missed the sum, substance of the scriptures of what they were trying to hold on to. And so I think that's a lesson for us, you know, always. We always have those two temptations that we can fall into. We can, we can compromise. Or we can become Pharisees and legalistic and my way or, or nothing else. Right? And so those are things I think we can learn from this. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the history that we can learn today. And thank you for um, especially that you, we just see that you are faithful, that you are always at work. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us not to respond in fear, but in belief. And give us eyes to see how you truly are working today. In Jesus' name, amen.